speak and then, okay, and then.
Testing. Test.
Is Cha C here? No? Oh, okay, Sherry. Sherry, you do, okay. I, um, I just, I was gonna say happy last day to him. Is it, is today his actual last day? And say the whole room went, ah. I'm sure, I need to go to one more hearing. Sherry. <laughs> but will you tell him we just really deeply appreciate all the work he did and we're gonna really miss him. And I, I'm excited for another organization, but not for us. So, but yeah, thank you. Welcome, everyone. And I apologize we're starting late. It was completely my fault. I apparently can't tell time today. So um, we're going to call our meeting to order, and we're just going to have everybody introduce themselves. And Ignacio, can I start with you? Uh, yes, good afternoon. Ignacio Guerrero, Director for the Department of Child Support Services. Hello, everyone. I'm Sandhya Hermon, uh, Deputy Director at SSA, sitting in for Bob Menicucci, Agency Director. Good afternoon. Rob Coelho from County Counsel's Office. Cindy Chavez, Board of Supervisors. Dave Cortezi, Board of Supervisors. John Mills for the County Executive's Office. And right now we have no public comment, so I'm gonna move to item three, and this is to approve our consent calendar. And um, just to, to say this out loud, um, on consent, I think we have only one item just look real quick at the agenda. Well, I was, what I was going to do was put, um, put the school link services um, plan on consent, unless there was something specific you wanted to ask about, Dave. No, that, that would be fine. Okay, so we would put item six, which is school link services on consent. And then, I don't think we have any minutes. Okay, then just that. Um, and without rigorous debate, please tell Cha we wish him all good things and that he should write home occasionally. All right. Um, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on to items four and five. And four um, and five are essentially their um, study sessions. And what I'd like to do is invite all the panelists for item four to come forward at this point. I think the, um, that Sharon, you're gonna be our presenter on this item. Oh. And I'm excited to see that we have uh, Terry up here and, and I'm not sure who that, if you could all, oh, Sheriff, and then if you could all just introduce yourselves as you join us for this part of the meeting. Great, Paul, welcome. Assistant Sheriff Ken Binder here on behalf of Sheriff Lloyd Smith. Great. Terry Harmon on behalf of DA Jeff Rosen. And I think we may have one more person joining us, uh, one or two people joining us. And just so you all know this, the reason we're using this, um, this format is, is that we wanted to invite experts in a whole bunch of different fields so that we can get feedback before we take any next steps with the board. So Sharon, do you wanna get us started? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Sharon Deneau with the South Bay Coalition and Human Trafficking. Uh, this report is essentially a white paper. It's really to capture different learnings that we can see, uh, summarizing what we're already seeing happening in our county with regards to illicit massage establishments, exploring existing uh, evidence-based approaches, um, promising practices, and existing research, also looking at partnerships and how the depth of partnership that we have uh, to combat illicit massage establishments. I'm gonna move through it really quickly, uh, but essentially the report includes methodology. The methodology is essentially a lot of interviews with various um, agencies and players who are working to combat massage establishments. Uh, there's also research that's included um, in the report. 
I want to give a big thank you to Basim Banafa. He consulted on this project and provided a lot of data that we see in the report. Um, that data is primarily coming from private sources of data, meaning there are peer review websites such as RubMaps where a lot of information from, I'll put quotes around consumers, but they're from members of the public who identify illicit massage establishments themselves. And so he really helped pull together a lot of the information. Uh, there are caveats with RubMaps, but it's worth using it as a tool to see trends and patterns, which I'll, I'll go over a few of the key trends and patterns that we see. Um, with regards to general strategies for massage establishments, one thing to pay attention to is different agencies have different units within their departments working on illicit massage establishments. And that may impact the type of investigation they have. So some departments have their vice unit, others have street crimes. Um, very few have officers who are focused on um, victims of gender-based violence really focusing on this issue, and that's something to consider. When we're talking about identification of illicit massage establishments, um, there are a number of red flags law enforcement can look for. They do utilize rub maps as a way of identifying high-risk establishments. But it's also worth noting that illicit massage establishments are, are something that are very visible to the public and highly reported. They're the second most prevalent reported complaint to the national hotline. In terms of demographics, um, it's really important to note that with mas illicit massage establishments, we're talking about an older demographic than we see uh, than in other forms of commercial sex. So um, that generally over 30 years old, predominantly foreign-born Chinese women. In Santa Clara County, we do see Vietnamese women, and we're starting to see a trend of Latino women who are also being exploited. Um, there have been no reports of males who are working in massage establishments for the purpose of being uh, of commercial sex. Um, and these trends are not necessarily seen in Alameda County or in other counties. This is a really significant slide because what it really shows is from 2016 to 2018, as the number of massage establishments in San Jose have been going down, the number in every other city in Santa Clara County has been going up. And this really affirms what law enforcement agencies have been saying, which is that it's a game of whack-a-mole. You shut down one massage establishment and it just pops up somewhere else. And it really, again, points to uh, a need for a regional approach. And while San Jose has about 50% of the massage establishments in our county, another way of looking at this is this chart that shows kind of saturation. So you can see that when we're looking at how many massage establishments are present in cities compared to residents, uh, Milpitas is significantly high. So they have a high saturation of massage establishments there. And so that's worth noting as well. Uh, the report includes Another trend that's significant, which is in Alameda County, they see increasing numbers of massage establishments along the BART corridor. And as we see expansion in our own county, that's something to consider and watch for. So there are a number of criminal approaches uh, that can be utilized to focus on massage establishments themselves. Um, it's very common to hear from all agencies that sex trafficking, there are a number of red flags for sex trafficking but it also appears to be the hardest criminal case to prove. Um, part of that has, has to do with the nature of sex trafficking, uh, low number of disclosures, um, as well as heavy reliance on victim testimony. And so when we started talking about other criminal approaches, labor trafficking also has a significant number of high red flags, um, but very few law enforcement agencies are really actively looking for labor trafficking. It may be more beneficial because there, are, there may be a higher likelihood of disclosure. There's less stain, shame and stigma associated with labor trafficking, um, but you still will rely on victim testimony. With financial crimes, you're talking about money laundering, tax evasion, insurance fraud. There are a lot of red flags for that as well. Um, this kind of approach does not really rely on victim testimony as heavily, uh, but it does require more specialized investigation with regards to forensic accountants who can assist with these cases. These accountants or analysts need to be culturally um, responsive in the sense of being able to identify bad players, as well as um, knowledgeable about trafficking. Uh, they might be able to identify debt bondage um, as well as wage theft. So financial focus, the other um, benefit would be being able to identify restitution for potential victims. There's a big gap in third-party liability. What most of the approaches that we see really focus on individuals who are on the work site, as opposed to other third parties who may not be present, but who play a significant role in um, the operation of massage establishments. 
On page 24 of the report, there's a number of different players that we see. I'll just highlight a few, including a rising trend of acupuncturists who may be leasing out their license to be able to open up uh, an acupuncture clinic. It's a loophole to massage establishments because you're allowed to provide some massage with, with acupuncture. Um, landlords and property owners, we're starting to see more of a focus on that, but they are certainly uh, culpable in a lot of operation of massage establishments. We also see a lot of fraud that happens because there's bureaucracy within our city and county governments. And so um, page 25 kind of looks more at this, but essentially what we find is that a massage business might apply for a zoning permit from the planning department and the registrant information um, will be different from their actual business permit, which will be di different from their business license that is submitted for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. And these agencies are not cross-referencing um, that information to be able to identify these bad players. Uh, a note about organized crime, I think there's an impression that there's larger organized international crime um, syndicates who might be working. There's not as much evidence there, but there certainly is a lot of evidence to indicate that massage establishments have a nexus to at least one other massage establishment. And so there might be opportunity there to focus uh, a more organized crime approach in that way, which would also allow for criminal forfeiture. And again, some of that restitution for potential victims. Demand focused techniques, uh, in general with commercial sex, there's very few demand focused techniques uh, that are being utilized and this is an area for potential growth. With regards to civil or administrative approaches, city and county ordinances are extremely important, but, and Santa Clara County has a model ordinance, um, but this needs to be replicated in other jurisdictions. Um, we need to be very proactive about our partnership with the California Massage Therapy Council. They provide certifications to massage therapists. Um, they look at massage schools so they know which ones have high red flags for fraud. Uh, they have a professional standards division, so they investigate fraudulent activity themselves. So having proactive relationship with them is really important. Code enforcement is really can be um, really beneficial in terms of, again, IDing high-risk establishments, but they also build really strong rapport with the business community. The Red Light Abatement Act is an old act, but can be extremely effective. It allows cities to levy fines against a property and enjoin that property from having an illicit massage establishment. In terms of collaboration, we see a number of different collaborative um, partnerships that are happening. Most of them are law enforcement or government based. There are very few that really actively involve service providers. And so that's something to consider, um, which also lends to the fact that there's less of a focus on potential victims. Um, I do want to highlight there's an interesting approach in San Francisco with the Department of Environmental Health where they take a know your rights approach. So again, it's that labor side that might be interesting to explore. I'm just cruising through this real fast. So key findings, a regional approach uh, to combating illicit massage establishments is needed. Gaps exist in our data collection, the reliability and information sharing across jurisdictions. Um, our jurisdictions really must utilize a, a mix of administrative, civil, and criminal approaches to comprehensively combat and prevent illicit massage, massage establishments. So we're talking about permanent disruption versus just the whack-a-mole approach of shutting it down temporarily. Criminal strategies should expand to consider intersectional issues such as labor exploitation, trafficking, and financial crimes. Administrative approaches need to look at those um, bureaucratic gaps that we were talking about, closing these gaps and identifying potential facilitators that allow and assist uh, massage establishments to operate covertly. Funding opportunities related to massage establishments shouldn't be reliant upon identification of sex trafficking. Because they are so hard to identify, it would really set ourselves up for, um, you know, misperceived not being successful. Uh, law enforcement and service providers need to proactively collaborate to effectively identify potential victims and taking it a step further, really providing a safe space for disclosure and providing opportunities for individuals to leave the massage, illicit massage establishment industry. And when I say there's a gap in the ability to offer culturally responsive services to women, I'm talking about cultural responsiveness in terms of the API community, but I'm also talking about a gap in terms of individuals who may not identify as victims of gender-based violence and identify as sex workers. We don't have a lot of opportunity to say, if you want to leave the life but don't want to identify as a victim, there's nothing really to provide in that instance. So that is a, a significant gap, um, especially for this demographic who are older and foreign-born and many, many times monolingual. 
collective impact requires a strategic effort that aligns resources across agencies and jurisdictions um, in order to provide accountability and a deterrent effect. And so these are the recommendations. Again, that collective impact um, idea that we really need mutually reinforcing activities across jurisdictions and across agencies. Shared measurement systems, so having resources that we can share like a regional database, maybe a regional analyst to look at different patterns. Shared um, language and cultural capacity tools. And then ensuring that all of our strategies that are comprehensive are accessible to small departments as well as large departments. Um, of course, training uh, is, is a recommendation with regards to cultural responsiveness, again, uh, language barriers that we see there. But also when I say effective enforcement, we're talking again about permanent disruption strategies, not just the strategies that may shut it down in one city, but it pops up somewhere else. And then cross-training on intersectional issues, so making sure that the investigating agency is looking for um, all those different potential layers of criminal activity. Partnership. Um, we really need to have multi-agency partnership and across jurisdictions. I already mentioned the funding. Um, and this is the big shout out page. These are all the individuals who really donated a significant amount of their time um, and their expertise to help inform this white paper. And uh, again, a big thank you to Bassam for um, consulting with the data that's included in the report. Thank you, Sharon. You did, that was a lot of information to do that quickly. Um, one thing I neglected just to share with everybody, and also welcome to Councilmember Esparza, perfect, perfect timing. Um, the, the two things I just wanted to make the group aware of, in whenever we started the Human Trafficking Task Force, and I actually can't remember what year that was, if it was 2014 or 2015. Yeah, it, it's been a while ago. Um, part of when we very first started to, to dive into this work, there was a lot we didn't understand about what was happening in our own community. And frankly, I think we were even more disjointed and disconnected from each other, the nonprofits, but even our own agencies. So I think we've come a long way. And I just really wanted to acknowledge you, Sharon, for um, helping us get moving in the right direction. As you may recall, Team one effort. of the first things that we did was um, we, we, we were really trying to better um, understand not just the enforcement side, but for the first time ever, we put a little bit of money, not much, frankly, into the um, services side. Since that time, um, after we did that, we and and the sheriff's office, um, you know, started the light task force, and then the um, the social services agency getting some statewide money was able to look at at-risk youth. I mean, there's a lot of ways we've started to really move on this in the, on the county side. And I think, frankly, because of the work that you and others did across the state, really helping the state understand there was a role for them to play in this. All that being said is there, there I just want to just really put a pin in the point that, um, that Sharon raised about funding. So part of the reason we have this great report is that we funded Sharon two years ago to do a regional collaborative in partnership with Alameda. And Sharon's relationships and our own relationships with Alameda County allowed us to begin those discussions. It's been a little harder to get that started than I expected, but you know, we'll, we'll keep at it. This year in the budget, we refunded that same program. We refunded at a slightly higher level, and I can't remember if it was for two years or, or three. Two. It was only for two. And part of the reason that that we did that was I've been really trying to better understand what is the very best way for the county to invest in our nonprofit partnership in this area. And I mention that because um, what, it, what I have been sort of struck by is that one of the institutions that our partnership really needs to be deepest with is really being able to take our nonprofit advocates and our um, nonprofit services and really better link them with our police services. The massage parlor um, ordinance, I'm just gonna use as an example. The county and the city of San Jose had a joint hearing about, I don't know, a month or two ago. And the, the point of that hearing was through our, our committee, Dave and I um, invited the, um, the Public Safety and Justice Committee of the City of San Jose to sit with us to have a bigger conversation around sexual assault and sexual predation. But again, much of this coming out of the massage parlor work that the City of San Jose was doing, because what the city did brilliantly was start 
going in and um, addressing these facilities directly. The two things that were missing was this kind of regional approach, which I get why. I mean, we're, it was the first time you'd done it, and that makes some sense. And the partnership that we really needed to have with our nonprofit partners so that we were able to have conversations with the people that were um, victims. And to your really important point, learning how to do it. Because I think you raise a good point about whether or not we talk about labor or sex trafficking. That is all to say that we're in the process of learning. And the reason I, to go back to this point, the reason I left the grant at two years is because one of the questions I've been asking myself is whether or not we need to fund our external partners to continue to do organizing work and really engaging the nonprofits and educating them and doing that kind of training work and whether or not we needed to internally have the program that Sharon's running be embedded in our public safety um, departments so that we were really being culturally competent from Jump Street, that we're really integrating in these ideas, particularly as it relates to how we address um, these kinds of crimes in general. And I just, I wanted, to, I wanted to lift that up for all of you because one of the questions I'm gonna be asking you all to think about is, what's the answer to that question? Do we wanna have more expertise in-house is, and I want to have this discussion with Sharon and with the, our nonprofit partners. Do we want to do we want to keep it external? Do we want to do both, which is have an internal partner in house and fund the um, and continue, and frankly, lift invest a little bit more in the funding that we're providing? And then just let me just make this all more complicated because it's not enough. Is that um, Again, Supervisor Cortezzi and I, through this committee, have convened a number of hearings. And out of those hearings, we have started to invest in domestic violence in a much bigger way um, in sexual assault because we just got that done not too long ago. Thank you to all of your good work. And then, um, and then we've really beefed up the capacity for the Office of Women's Policy to help us on the policy side. But again, I think that's in a different part of the organization than on the public safety side. So as we start to increase, and I think right now, I don't know exactly where we're gonna be, but my hope is that we're increasing our funding to these organizations. I have a, a $20 million price tag in my head in terms of investment. No, nobody else does right now, but that's mine. Uh, you know, to, to, that, that we're able to fund these nonprofits to work on a whole litany of issues relative, relative to victims and giving them the flexibility to respond however they see appropriate so that they would be able to respond when San Jose PD is knocking on doors, that San Jose PD would be able to reach out to, you know, the, the head of the coalition and saying, hey, we're gonna be doing these following actions. We're gonna need our nonprofit partners to be ready to provide services. Let's go to work. Let's get that done. That's a longer term uh, vision that we, that we really take a look at violence against fill in the blank broaden the pot, increase the flexibility, but increase the accountability too as it relates to that body of work. So I know that's a lot to put out there, but I wanted that as background. And I really wanna just get your feedback and thoughts on um, Sharon's um, study. And I'm really, I'm opening it up to everybody who's on the dais. I, this isn't just Dave and I, but we are really interested in hearing from all of you. Thoughts or questions that you may have or ideas? Yeah, of course. Before people comment further. Um, what are we what are we doing uh, you you just talked a little bit about the um, sort of social service implications I was involved most directly with this subject matter in the 2013 2014 time frame when by referral or inventory item in the budget process we created the the human trafficking task force in, inside it was really more of an operational thing uh, that we we did um, to, to create the human trafficking task force in the sheriff's office. And then subsequent to that, some of this other work has been done, which I haven't been directly involved with. So this report is illuminating, you know, in terms of kind of getting me caught up on what's been going on in this um, regional or sub-regional effort that's been going on. Um, what the report talks about and that we just heard is, is a lot of need for interagency cooperation on the enforcement side and, and I sort of heard I think uh, in the presentation just some some reference to 
the, the victim side of it from a social service standpoint. If for just I'm just taking a shortcut by labeling it that way. Um, Chair Chavez, you you talked a little bit more just now, you know, about the bigger view and reference the social service side of it. So as I sit here, I mean, she just wanted my uh, Rorschach reaction. It's what, what I feel like I need more of is to hear more about the social service side. You know, what are we doing? Um, all, the work that I've continued on my own to sort of stay up to speed and be exposed to this whole subject matter is through through groups like Beyond the Bar, Beyond the Bench, uh, and um, you know, work that, that folks in our justice system have come together, you know, in more like more of a symposium fashion to talk about, you know, how do we how do we deal with the victimization side in a more um, comprehensive way, or maybe a, a more well-funded way, in a more resourced way. So I, I I hope first of all let me let me stop right there real um, and be real clear that I'm not suggesting that one is needed over the other. I I, I just it's, it's this is great. Um, and it seems like it's going the right direction, and implementation is obviously key. But then on the social service side, I feel um, when, I, when I say social service side, I'm kind of lumping <laughs> behavioral health and everything else, every, what we would normally call RAP, um, on the not just on the perpetrator side, but on the on the victimization side. You know, and maybe you could speak about that a little more, Supervisor Chavez, yeah. because I guess that's what I'm inviting. Because I'd like to just hear hey, Phil, a yeah, deeper okay. dive into that side of it, um, especially so, given the nature of our committee here. Yeah. So, um, so here's what I would say, and I, um, and Perla, you may want to help us a little bit with this if you could come forward. But what what has happened is that when we started the Human Trafficking Task Force, the the thing that I was clear about is that really the only kind of candle in the wind, for lack of a better word, was, was the South Bay Coalition. And we hadn't really integrated a lot of what the South Bay Coalition was suggesting we do, either in terms of what we were funding from a, um, from a nonprofit perspective. In fact, I don't think we funded any of their services. We put a little bit of money into their services before we did anything else when we started the, the, um, the committee and then under the leadership of the district attorney and the sheriff's office, and I think actually, Sheriff Bender, this was really maybe on the police agency side, we started the light task force to really start to coordinate efforts at that time, both to address um, um, sex traffic, but also labor trafficking. What then happened, and this was, this was based on the hearings that we had, it became clear to me that we had really underfunded all of the agencies that were partnering with us so that we were giving them little bits of money to de do DV or to do work in, um, actually I don't even think we were really funding much to do sexual assault, so we were funding very little bits of money. So the idea with these larger block grants was to try to put, infuse within that system resources that allowed them to better structure their services. I think one thing that, um, and actually it was Perla who showed me a really good chart that helped me understand this, that that really in some respects, um, at the at, well, the, the, the way we were funding them is we give them a little, we in the state would give them a little bit of money to deal with DV, a little bit of money to deal with sexual assault, and, and this is from a bunch of different funding sources. We were holding them account to say what they were spending these little bits of money on when really you could have a victim who came to see you for one thing and had been a victim of domestic violence and sexual assault. And so really, as we started to move these chunks of resources, so our first chunk being the little bit we put into the, um, the, the social services work that I think is timed out, right? I mean, we're, are we still funding you to do anything relative to human trafficking? Sorry. Yes, there is currently a grant that goes, to, uh, a county grant that goes through the Catherine George Alexandria Community Law Center, and it's for workplace crimes, and that provides a little bit of funding for legal services and advocacy. So Catherine and George subcontracts with Community Solutions, Aki, and the YW, 
and each one of our organizations provides about 75% of an advocate to provide support to human trafficking survivors. But the total amount is, how much is it? Like $4 is what it feels like to me. I mean, I mean, relative to the work. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's a small amount of money. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I think for community solutions, it's roughly about 100,000 a year, 120,000 yeah. a year. And we had originally done, uh, our original grant was in the $500,000 range to, but, but, and I think, so, what the goal is, and this is partly why I'm using this $20 million number, is what I would really like us to be funding is giving them the flexibility to um, to serve whoever's coming through the door and not worry so much about checking a particular box, but funding a certain number of people to get a certain number of services, especially because some of these have family implications and all kinds of other kind of complications to them. Um, so what, when we just did the funding, the first $5 million that um, went out for um, to fight domestic violence. This next $5 million tranche that we're moving forward, what I've asked the staff to do is make sure that the end of the first $5 million, those contracts, is aligned with the end of the second $5 million. So these contracts may be shorter. So that what we're able to do is combine the five and the five so that the nonprofits are going to be able to apply for prevention of all in all of these categories and be able to provide for services in all of these categories. That's really what we're trying to get. And I think that's gonna take us about probably two and a half, three years to get all of this aligned. I, I appreciate that. That's helpful uh, to understand how, how actions we've taken recently might be implemented, you know, sort of more specifically into this area. I think when we talk about um, rape, crisis response, um, domestic violence response, and the, the hearing that we had where we started to talk more about prevention. Um, there's another kind of slice there, which I think is victimization. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not too late to deal with prevention and tie that to the victimization part when you're on the, on the trafficking side. Mm -hmm. Is that, am I, I'm not sure if I'm making sense. You're totally making sense, yeah. Because I think that's a... And actually, that's a I point you all have made with us. I think it's a segment of all this that is... Um, I don't know, how, I don't really even know how to say, how to, how to articulate what I'm saying, but it's a segment of both on the criminal activity side, but also on the victimization side that doesn't necessarily um, fit neatly into response mechanisms that um, are more traditional. And, and part of it is because folks are continue, are, are being victimized on an ongoing basis so they don't get to come up for error and, and get the assistance that they need. Um, part of it is, is because of really, I think probably in the past, more focusing in this area on, on the enforcement side because there's such a need for enforcement and even just going back the, the measure I said I was mm -hmm. responsible for bringing forward some years ago was really strictly on the enforcement side. It didn't occur to me at that time to say, well, let's put, let's double down. Let's say here's, you know, here's the money for the sheriff's office on the enforcement side. And oh, by the way, let's match that with money, you know, for the victims as they um, are discovered through that enforcement work. Mm -hmm. it, and, and I'm not sure we get that from anywhere else. Like you're making me understand that not only are we not getting it from anywhere else, but the work is funded so poorly up until right now that, um, you know, it's just another one of those hugely underfunded areas in terms of, um, in terms of county effort, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily strictly on the women's side, right? When you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, and none of this is, none of it mm -hmm. is, is strictly gender. We, we heard that loud and clear. Uh, during the hearing that we had recently. So anyway, that's, I, I, I won't say anything more. I just wanted to um, make sure that we're, that the discussion is willing to continue to dive into that area and, and treat it as in some ways the same, but in some ways unique um, in terms of need. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would just add one other thing is that the discrete pot of money, so the investment that we're looking at um, what I wanted to make sure of is that when we're talking about the investment, we're talking about it, the investment with our nonprofit partners. Right. That the that the 
money that we're using for our own support of these efforts be really counted in a different bucket. So for example, the Office of Women's Policy has David two staff people that are that are going to be helping with the contracts for all of these this work. And those the resources for those two are not coming out of the the, the actual money that we're pushing out to the nonprofits. Um, we also took an action yesterday asking the staff to look for a way to fund um, the two rape crisis centers because the state so cr underfunds them so poorly. By the way, we're going to write a letter. We got to write a letter to the governor, and I'm really saying that to you because I didn't think about. I meant to say that yesterday when we were in our hearing, that we've got to write a letter to the governor demanding that they invest more in this statewide because, frankly, that we're coming up to help. That's not happening all over the state. I know it isn't because I've talked to some of my colleagues in other counties, and they, this isn't even on their radar not even on their radar. So um, the other thing we looked at was taking the additional resource that we were going to need for those two centers and not pulling it out of the five million base that we were looking at already. And part of the reason for that is recognizing that in addition to this work that's ongoing already that's underfunded, that we, we, we have a whole bunch of other work we need to get done. So again, you know, I just, I'm, I'm more saying that so if I get hit by a bus, <laughs> you all know what the intent was. Can so don't try to mess around. Can I ask, can I ask a, a specific question based on sort of a non, it's not really a hypothetical fact pattern, but obviously, obviously no name involved. So if our, if our hot, hotline, either at Office of Labor Standards or our general whistleblower hotline here receives a call from somebody who's, who's being trafficked in a workforce situation and um, there, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, I know what happens if it's, if it's, if they're being trafficked and they're being threatened from an immigration standpoint specifically, that there's some likelihood that that call will get referred over to, to someone on the, the county's funded immigration legal response side. But if they're just, if they're calling and saying, I'm being trafficked, I'm not being paid, I'm being threatened and I'm being abused. Where, where does that call go right now in terms of county response or community-based agency response? How is, how is that call kept confidential? And then how does the victim get assistance for the trauma that they're going through right now? That, that, and that last phrase is what I'm sort of really focused on. So Ruth I, I is actually that, raising her hand, but what I'm going to do is, is David still in here? And that can be, that could, that could oh, be, David, a, yeah, that could be, that could be, come take, forward and then Ruth, I'll call a, you next. Okay. Okay. If, if it's, if it's too lengthy of a, an issue, I could certainly take my response, then, you know, publicly off agenda. But <laughs> so I want your thoughts on this as well. If I may, pressure. through, mm -hmm. through the chair, uh, David Campos, deputy county executive, uh, I actually was having this conversation with Betty from the Office of Labor Standards uh, Enforcement this morning, and she was actually meeting with folks who work on human trafficking to uh, understand uh, at what point the OLC should come into the picture, mm -hmm. because to the extent that they're being trafficked, there are you know wage and labor implications as well. Uh, so I don't know that we have an answer right now, supervisors, in terms of what that should look like or when it should happen, but we're trying to figure that out because there is intersectionality. And one of the things that we're trying to do as we come back to you in August with the uh, proposal around gender-based violence uh, is making sure that that program is working with OLSC to include in that, mm -hmm. you know, in the, the, the proposal uh, that piece as well. So we're thinking about it. If you have any ideas or suggestions, or I'm sure that Ruth uh, will <laughs> let Ruth us can know. Almost not we're handle open herself to, back to that, but we were actually yeah. talking about this very topic this morning. Ruth, do you want to come forward? And then David, do you mind just staying for a minute? Because um, because I'm going to come back to you, and I I'm really appreciate that you're here. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, our, the community bid or on the RFP mm, was that we just accepted. voted on yesterday. Yes. yes. And I'm uh, responsible for the advice line, and I have attorneys in uh, who speak Tagalog, Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, and then of course English. And um, I do work with a coalition. We have obviously I'm labor labor I'm a legal services chair, and we do have a point system, and so. 
we're doing trainings on labor trafficking and sex trafficking, on trafficking in general, for all the attorneys on the line, plus the community partners. So everybody's going to be up to speed, at least on the advice line, and know exactly what to do, how to get them to serve. We do this all the time. We go out on operations and all of that. Now, for your hotline, that's something that is internal and separate, and that's something that's good. Right, that we're going to be working on. Yeah, but the advice line, we have We got gotcha. you. We got gotcha. that. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, I really appreciate Supervisor Cortese your interest in ensuring that all victims are connected to support immediately. Um, as Ruth mentioned, we have a point agency system in our county, so Community Solutions is the lead, and any time a victim of human trafficking or potential victim is identified, that system is activated within one hour. We're in contact with the individual, and we provide all the uh, all basic needs, emergency shelter, food, clothing, etc., and follow-up support, wraparound services for an average of three years for every human trafficking victim that we support. And then the question Supervisor Chavez was saying, as a ratio to need, how, how well is that funded? Is okay. the system overwhelmed, is it underwhelmed, or is it just right, spot on? I think that, well, we never want to say that we're... Um, is it close enough? Under, yeah, I think currently in, in our county, we're fortunate to have roughly uh, 12 full-time employees that are dedicated to human trafficking uh, among the victim service providers. That includes community institutions, the YW, and Asian Americans for Community Involvement, and that's through funding that the coalition has been able to secure through the state, the federal funding, and then also county funding. So I think that now um, we haven't been overburdened with, because um, we support survivors of all types of trafficking, all ages, all genders, um, where I think that we'll need additional support, particularly with the I API community, as we start doing more outreach um, mm -hmm. to that community as well. So I think that when we, uh, we can start doing more outreach to specific populations. There will be an, an influx of additional survivors that will need support. And I think that's going to be particularly true with the contract we just uh, voted on yesterday, that a big component of that is outreach and education. So I think the other thing that I'll just point out that will sound obvious to you, but um, and I actually had to call, call Perla because somebody um, came to the office, came to me and said, I'm having another problem. They were actually afraid of a of a spouse and saw just literally picked me off the internet as an elected official, wanted to come and talk to me. But the more I talked to the person, I didn't realize they were a victim of sexual violence, domestic violence, and had been trafficked, like the, the way the person ended up in my office. And I called Perla and I called the Sheriff's Department because I, I realized I didn't have, it wasn't a normal constituent case. My, my only point in that is I think we're gonna kick up a lot of situations where people are gonna understand that they're being taken advantage of. Oddly enough, what I find fascinating is that people understand the wage and hour issue because I think the state's just been so solid on that for such a long time. It's been a system that's been in place. So one of the things I learned from Ruth is the number of people we get from wage and hour violations is actually one of the leading ways we find victims of labor trafficking. So. Thank you. David, did you want to add something? And then I'm going to point, I'm going to looking at you all. I think it's just, uh, it's a two-way street in terms of identifying the, the different uh, violations, right? That as you're investigating wage theft, you can actually, you know, use that as a way of finding out, you know, if there is human trafficking, sex trafficking going on, and, and, and the other way around, that when there is that kind of uh, trafficking, that, that wage theft is always, you know, seems to me to be an issue as well. So, so this is an opportunity to, to have uh, a lot of collaboration between the different agencies and then making sure that the funding takes that into account so that there's alignment. Mm -hmm. Any, I'm gonna go to you all, um, to Paul or Ken or Terry, if there's any feedback or thoughts that you have about what you've heard today or next steps you wanna recommend. Well, first of all, I just, um, like to thank the Board of Supervisors and your foresight uh, and, and seeing this issue years ago when you funded the Light Task Force and actually uh, providing the funding for the positions at the District Attorney's Office and the Sheriff's Office both have, have been able to fill those. Um, there's a, a deputy DA assigned to the unit and a DA investigator as well as uh, several Sheriff's Office personnel. So it's not just the Sheriff's Office, it's definitely a countywide collaborative. It, yeah, we have seen some results, um, and uh, we've we've learned and grown along the way uh, over the years. Um, currently, in terms of illicit massage, 
establishments. Uh, there were a year or two ago, there was three in the unincorporated areas where, where our jurisdiction is. And um, we were able to partner, the light task force, uh, DA's office and sheriff's office were able to partner with code enforcement, uh, county council, even environmental health, and uh, uh, go into the establishments to conduct compliance checks and um, identify issues in there. And, and actually at this current time, um, there are no IMEs within the county unincorporated jurisdiction, and we don't have any pending um, permits as well. I also want to commend the, the Board of Supervisors for your foresight in um, looking at the massage uh, ordinance uh, permit requirements, and you've, you've made changes there over the last uh, few years, which has also uh, resulted benefits. And so um, I think it's, it, it gives us just more tools to um, to look at uh, the applications that are coming in and to really vet them. And, um, and we look forward to working regionally uh, with our other law enforcement partners to um, just really to try to combat and tackle this issue and other within the municipalities as well. So we're excited about what you've been doing um, and about what the board has done in the past. Um, and we just want to help be part of the solution moving forward as well. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, I just um, just a couple comments. So, in the last year and a half, San Jose PD has um, pushed out 163 illicit massage businesses in our city, and uh, displacing that many businesses uh, obviously has had a ripple effect on the county, um, as Sharon had mentioned. So, with that being said, I, I think it's it's um, very important that we not only continue to collaborate with the other jurisdictions in our county, uh, but also partner with with our nonprofits, uh, which which we recently started doing. So we, whenever we are preparing to do a massage parlor operation, we will call them well in advance, and they will actually come out with us now, and, and that's something new that that we're doing. Um, and that way we have the experts right on hand with us if we do come across a survivor. So one thing I will also say is this industry is always evolving and I think that's another mm -hmm. important point why we need to involve um, our nonprofits. Uh, so we have experts that are keeping track of the trends, the patterns, how this industry is avoiding law enforcement, which they are doing, uh, and they and they do that by by uh, changing their 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 business. Uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of them in hair and nails now. So it, it is evolving. They are trying to avoid detection. So I think it, it would it's very beneficial to have subject matter experts uh, that are directly involved that can assist us uh, in our enforcement efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon, for the information and, and for your presentation. One of the things that we've learned over the years with light is to appreciate that human trafficking is really an onion with many, many layers. And we have found that exploitation occurs on a continuum. Mm -hmm. And the human trafficking task force light has dealt with uh, demand reduction projects and the labor side of trafficking, the sex side of trafficking, the commercial sex worker part that doesn't, uh, doesn't qualify as trafficking under the penal code, uh, as well as uh, wage theft and massage parlors. And so there are so many issues and parts of the human trafficking puzzle that while I agree it's good to work region, regionally because this is a crime and a social issue that does not appreciate boundaries and it's very fluid among our borders. But I'm, I'm wondering, Sharon, when I think of us working regionally, I wonder if it would be better if we picked an issue with under the umbrella of human trafficking and if we worked with other counties specifically on massage parlors. 
this Thank is you. our issue. Mm -hmm. My concern is that if we just say human trafficking, we all will have different priorities based on what's going on in our county, in our cities. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that or if you pictured, uh, you could share with us what you picture the regional collaboration to look like. Yes, um, thank you for asking that. And I'm sorry I didn't articulate it better, but really when I was talking about the collective impact approach, it's intended to be a nuanced approach. So we want to be co have collective impact on illicit massage establishments. And w within that, it might be looking at investigations that focus on trafficking, but as we saw, there are a number of other criminal approaches that we can use to hold individual, these property owners and the ultimate beneficiaries accountable. So um, what would be amazing to see is within our county at the very least that we could have a working group that dedicated a certain period of time exclusively focused on illicit massage establishments because there are a lot of nuances. Even when we're talking about service provision, um, illicit massage establishments, they are very sophisticated. And a lot of the women who are working, there's a lot of transients to the point where even if services are offered, they're, they're moving to another county or they're going to another city and it's hard to keep that continuity. Um, there was notes uh, about a nexus to LA. A lot of the women have 310 numbers. And so we really need to have a work group that's sharing this information so we can start to identify these ultimate beneficiaries. And that would require a longer term investigation. It would require a longer term commitment. And again, um, when we talked about that collective impact where we have um, approaches that don't contradict each other, they're really enhancing each other's approaches. So if one type of operation, are we, are we ensuring we're looking at all types of criminal um, crimes that are occurring? to shut down as many as possible and not just pushing them to another jurisdiction. Hopefully I, I articulated that better, but I think the intention is a nuanced approach where we are looking and targeting illicit massage establishments um, as a focus area. I think but, just to okay. follow up on that, um, Terry, just I, I think what's interesting about the way you just put it and just even hearing Sharon that, you know, one area that I don't think we've jumped into at quite a deep enough level is how we bring to bear um, the financial crimes that we know are taking place. Because in some ways where we're gonna have a harder time addressing issues where it requires a, you know, someone who's brave enough to report and be a witness and all of those other things, you know, sometimes it's really the money that is easier for us to follow up on. And I just wanna, so I wanna lift up, the other point I wanna lift up is what Paul just said about, um, you know, what what is happening. I think you mentioned it too, you know, we're looking at acupun acupuncture, we're looking at nail salons, we're looking at hair, hair salons, we're really looking at things that can stand up a business relatively quickly. The licensure is pretty low, you know, the bar for licensure, and actually, and and then being able to to move move on. And so I think, I think you raise an excellent point because what it made me think about is if we know, for example, that the route that people are being victimized, that they're taking a route of here to Sacramento, to Oakland, for a very particular line of this business, that may be the loop we wanna take a look at irrespective of other partnerships that we have where we say, you know what, we, you know, let's talk to these other agencies and let's also look at what they've collected relative to financial crimes because some, so, for example, we may have a DA's office in Sacramento that's hot and heavy on a couple of people already that we have an opportunity to say, okay, let's let's look at these cases together. Um, but I think you're right. I think we have to do we have to do much more. We we've started with a bit more of a blanket. We've got to be much more precise. And part of the reason we asked that Sharon actually we didn't ask her. Sharon really came really told us, hey, let's focus on this particular issue. Is that it's one that it's got a lot of moving parts to it but it's one that we that we have the tools in the toolbox, particularly because of some of the state laws and local laws that we've changed to really be able to leverage the opportunity. So I think you're totally right. If I may, Supervisor, uh, to the Chair, um, one thing that I would note looking, going back to the chart of the various cities and the level of concentration of, of massage parlors, uh, OLSC is starting a pilot in three different uh, jurisdictions with Mopitas being one of them. And so, you know, so I think this presents an opportunity to figure out as we're developing the pilots, you know, how this could be a part of the, of, of the, the, 
the scope of, of the pilot. Uh, you know, Al Capone was went to jail for tax evasion, right? Not for some of the other stuff that he was doing. So you you use whatever tools you have, mm -hmm. and so I think I think that's an interesting graphic because it allows us to think about how we can use what we're doing, you know, as a tool. And I just want to reiterate that that's really when we talk about having a forensic accountant or a forensic analyst really focused on this data collection. I was just really lucky that um, Basson offered uh, to assist in pulling this information. He's right in the back. But um, that Thank would be- Thank you very cool. much. I know. Thank you. So um, <laughs> that I think in itself is a really good investment because then we can really start to look regionally at the data and trends as they're coming in. Yeah, and I think the district attorney's office, I know the city of San Jose, I, I'm not so sure, uh, um, Sheriff Bender, if this is the case for the sheriff's office yet, but I think we have a number of analysts right now that we can tap to that we hadn't, we didn't have before, right? We're beefing up our staff, so. Um, I just wanted to see if either Sylvia or Maya wanted to weigh in, and then I'll, after you do, I'm gonna talk about some next steps. Thank you. I should have been able to figure that one out. <laughs> um, so I, I want to thank uh, Supervisor uh, Cortezzi and Chavez for, for your efforts and um, your willingness to partner with the city of San Jose on some of these very important issues and uh, for your recent um, uh, memos that you've submitted for the funding because I know that prioritizing these types of issues is one thing, but if we don't have the funding behind it, we hardly get any movement. And so I appreciate that both of those things happen at the same time um, and, uh, and really spurred us to do the same on our end. And so, as you know, my uh, four female colleagues, uh, myself, we all wrote a memo and asked for some movement in this uh, area of when we first started uh, talking about all of this, we said we were gonna first focus on sexual assault, and so that's the first thing that we're looking at. And I agree with with, uh, with the DA um, in terms of her isolating one thing that we can all uh, address uh, collectively. And so we, we're doing the same thing over on the other side. We're, we're um, yeah. taking a look at our systems, and one of the, uh, the triumphs was uh, for us was uh, our memo uh, was approved and in our memo we asked for a study session that came from um, council member Esparza. We also asked for our administration um, to have a task force to actually speak on these items. Um, and then lastly, to have a work plan from the San Jose Police Department to address sexual assault. So when we uh, talk about sexual assault, it's, it's really hard for me, I think, to untangle any one of these other um, areas that we've been talking about, and this, this time we're talking about uh, human trafficking. Um, because like you said in your example, that person that came to your office was one in the same. It was you know these different tracks, and that's one of the reasons why um, I'm really motivated to, to change the system for our really young survivors, because that creates a whole pipeline for any of these three tracks, right? So the domestic violence, the human trafficking, the commercial sex, um, and and I want to make sure that at least our system isn't uh, allowing anything to fall through the cracks, and that we we're doing our best to actually make some movement in there. And so, um, so thank you for helping spur all of this uh, movement. And uh, and I think you know there's a lot of passion and interest on our end to to also look at these systems that haven't been looked at for a bit. And um, as uh, Paul, you mentioned earlier, there's, there was 163 closed last year, uh, illicit massage parlors. There's quite a bit in my district and in Council of Versparsa's district. Um, so that was good to see. Um, uh, the unfortunate uh, result, um, and one of the things that, that um, caught my attention, and I had a, a personal conversation with our chief of police about this, is that there were zero human trafficking cases that came out of this. So with 163 closures, I would imagine that there would, at minimum, be one, two, I don't know, some, something that would result in, all, in, in terms of closing all of those um, 
uh, illicit massage parlors. And for me, the concern was that we were just pushing this problem out, and as we can, and as that uh, um, slide shows us, it, we pushed it out over to Milpitas and Campbell and Cupertino, because as far as I'm concerned, those, those are the same survivors that we saw in San Jose just getting moved around. And, and for me, I feel that that is a failure on our part of our system to push these uh, potentially survivors or victims of, of, of these crimes, if they're not willing and, and they're on their own accord, that we've just pushed the problem out. And so I'm, I'm really pleased to see in your, uh, in your presentation and in the conversation that I'm hearing that we wanna take a regional approach to this um, and, and completely support that. One of the things I wanted to point out is that recently there's been a uh, data sharing platform, and I don't know if you've talked about this earlier, and I apologize, it came in a little bit late, I was in committee. But there's a, a forensic logic or leap, it's a new data sharing platform. It was uh, set up about a year ago, and this allows, um, I think, every city in Santa Clara County to share suspect uh, info. Um, the problem with that is that not every agency uh, inputs the same information. So, so say there is there is a massage parlor in San Jose that gets denied a license. Well, maybe San Jose doesn't input that in their data sharing um, uh, system, and so then Milpitas can't know that they've been denied, or Tino can't know that they've been denied. Um, and so we really need to take a look at one of the recommendations I'd, I'd um, like to move forward is to um, have a standardized uh, sharing of information. What is it at minimum that we are going to submit into this uh, platform so that it is helpful to the rest of the cities um, around us? Um, and I'm not sure if this is the 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 venue where we do this, but I, or in any of the other uh, sub uh, task forces, but I think it, it, it's one of the areas that I think in terms of systems that we can improve. Mm -hmm. It's easy system compared to some of the other ways that we are dealing with this, right? I think that's really helpful. And, I, and let me just say for next steps, what I was hoping to do was ask um, Terry, Ken, and Paul, um, along with, the um, maybe a representative from the police officer, the chiefs association, because I can't remember who's the chief of chiefs right now. <laughs> oh, that's right, Max. Um, and he's from Mountain View, which has a little problem here. I'm looking at my chart. Yeah. Um, and so what I was hoping to do was ask the, our public safety and justice partners to take a look at this report with Sharon, at least do one kind of follow up just so we could, if you it would give everybody a chance to say, here are the two or three things I think we have to prioritize. And then um, have that come back uh, to this committee so we could bring it to the full board. And then we could share those recommendations with you um, as well. So all of the agencies that are up here, we would say, here are the recommendations that we're gonna make for the board. We, so th that's, that, that's what I see as a really concrete next step. I think the issue around data sharing is a really core component of that. I think that's right, and um, and it's something I know Sharon's raised with me too in mm -hmm. terms of how do we how do we do that. And so one other recommendation I would make is that when we do the follow up meeting, that we also invite for each agency the analyst for that agency who's doing their crime um, data analysis because I think it would help us have a conversation both about the technical layer of this, the investigative layer of this, and the nonprofit. Um, you know, component of this. And so, Sharon, I know you are, and for all intents, the South Bay Coalition, but it may be of value to have an additional person from the coalition participate in the discussion. Um, anything else that you wanna add to the thinking list? Or um, the next steps list? I, I do have another um, item, and I, I'm not sure how we deal with this, and th maybe this is part of training, and I heard um, people say that it needed to be culturally appropriate in the languages that we see um, out there when either they're doing stings or, or, or for whatever reason, for whatever, uh, whatever capacity. Um, the, the other, so I, I support that. Um, but the last piece is um, how are we, uh, how are we 
addressing human trafficking in our own um, police units. So how are we investing our time there? I know from, from sitting on public safety uh, committee that uh, I've seen like prostitution rings come in where there's you know like 749 women who were arrested um, yet there was only 111 Johns arrested um, and uh, 486 persons arrested one time, not repeat offenders, so those are just like one time folks, but 27 people made up three or more arrests, 27. So that means to me that there's, you know, there's a core of, of, of these women who either are coming in on their own or coming in on a, for, a forced network. And these are one and the same. We had this 14 year old um, that was, that was just um, assisted through, uh, you know, she reached out to the system and she was being held against her, her will. And, and I don't know if you all have heard of the story, yeah, she's 14 years old. She had run away and then was kidnapped by these three men. Um, I think originally from Chicago, got moved around in the country, ended up here in San Jose off of, um, um, off of Tully. And um, she's the one who reached out. But this, this young gal was probably out in the streets. And so we see her out in the streets as a, what we people call a sex worker or a prostitute, right? And so we deal with her differently than when she's reaching out and saying, I am a victim, I am a survivor, I wanna get out of this situation. And then it becomes the, the effort to assist that survivor is completely different. But this is the same girl, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I think in everything that we do in, in, in addressing commercial sex or um, uh, human trafficking, that we have to take a look at who uh, these, these women are um, because I think they're, the, the, this, they come from the same pipeline that I'm mm -hmm. talking about. And this is the pipeline of sexual assault and they've gone through different, just different tracks. Right. Um, and so, so I think the, the training is, is absolutely um, important, um, but how we invest our time in our human trafficking unit is also equally as important. I think that human trafficking unit um, can't just focus on recovery. We have to do enforcement. Right. So let me make a recommendation on that on mm -hmm. that topic, Sylvia. And um, and Paul, you may not be aware of this, but um, both the sheriff and Terry and I and um, Chief Garcia and um, can't remember the other uh, members of this committee. We have a, a committee to the um, human trafficking committee. It's a working group. That, that we're having this discussion about how we address prostitution because I totally agree with you is on a continuum it's one day they're a prostitute the another day they're a victim of sexual assault another, you know mm -hmm. and we and almost depending on where you are on the continuum of being a victim is how is what our response is instead of having kind of a broader response but this issue around sex work in particular is one that really requires us to take a deeper dive so right. I don't know when the next meeting is scheduled for, um, but we are in the process of trying to schedule it. And so what I um, would just do is we'll invite both of you to participate in it. I think there's no Brown Act or anything for you guys because there's a hundred of you, but 11, you know, so you guys are in better shape. Like hundred. <laughs> You're in better shape, but if the two of you would like to participate, we'll make sure you get involved in that. And then Paul, what I would just say that would be of help is that um, when we had done these meetings in the past, it had primarily been, I think Terry, you were there for, um, for Jeff. She, Lori participated and so did Eddie. And I, again, what I would say is I think there was a lot of value to bring in the analysts because mm -hmm. one of the challenges we were having with that conversation was the conversation about how many people are we talking about and then really taking a look at the continuum in a very intellectually honest way and saying, um, why, depending on where you are on this, are we treating you one way? Both, how does the, the why does the law, we understand why the law does that, although I would argue that needs to be fixed, but that that in terms of our, our service response and the level of response is very different. Now, 
and so I think it, we could talk about that literally all day here, but what I would recommend is that we bring that, that piece of the discussion down to the, um, oh, and you know what else? I think that the Chief of Chiefs was also participating, like, and it was someone other than Max last time. But we should also just invite Max again. Who was it now? Oh, that's right. It, that's right. It was Chief Sellers. Um, and, and, and that I had a nice fit for another reason. But we can invite the Chief of Chiefs, too, because I just, it's in some ways, it's a very philosophical question. And we've been talking about it anecdotally mm -hmm. instead of numerically. And I think and when we talk about it anecdotally, everybody's values and perspectives get drowned out by what's really happening. And so in any case, we'll, we'll make sure we invite you to that. Great, thank you. Uh, and, and I think you, you, you absolutely, I, uh, thank you for, for directing um, this to, to that work group. Um, so I appreciate the work on the illicit massage parlor because these girls are one and the same. And then hopefully we'll move into also commercial uh, sex. Um, General, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I appreciate your comments. That's right on. Yeah. Maya, did you have anything you want to add? Will you turn that on again? Yeah. It was fixing me up. Press input instead of mic. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Um, I, I'm actually really enthusiastic about um, working together and combining administrative, civil, and criminal approaches to this, because I agree, just if you can't get them on one, we can get them on the other. And um, and so to be able to coordinate that and move that forward, mm -hmm. um, I know we have a lot of these um, places in our establishments in our districts. Um, and so I think that can be a really fruitful approach. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Great. So um, we're going to ask you all to take a dive into the report. Give us your feedback. Um, we'll, Maya will just want to weigh in mostly on just timing because I'd love to get your feedback back here before we move too far on next set of investments and strategies. Um, so we'll work that out. And then the other thing I would just recommend is that we invite um, the Office of Labor Standards to participate too. And I'm really glad you were here, David. And if I'd been really thinking, I would have said, thought about that even sooner. So thank you. Um, so, oh, the other group that participated actually was the Office of Women's Policy, David. So at that time, I don't remember who it was, but we it would be good to have someone assigned to participate. So I have asked the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement and also the new uh, gender-based violence program to which is overseeing. This is Carla Collins overseeing Great. all of that. They'll they'll be involved as well. Great, thank you. All right, so thank you very much, everybody, for participating. You don't have to stay for the next one as much as you want to, um, but I will just uh, say thank you how much we appreciate that. Sharon, thank you for all your good, good work. We really appreciate it. And for the advocates that were here, thanks for being here. We didn't have any cards on this, right, Frank? Okay. All right, so with that, Dave, you're good? Okay, so with that, we're going to move to item five, and this is the Office of Cultural Competency, and this is a... Um, uh, this is about our disproportionate representation of youth of color in our child welfare system and our juvenile justice system. So you're welcome to stay if you want. It's totally up to you. Um, okay. That's a, yeah, everybody's like, no, thank you, Cindy. No. Um, it is. <laughs> the systems improvement plan and um, all the title uh, four work that's being done. So I'm really excited to invite up our panel, and I'm going to ask um, if it, folks can introduce themselves and let you take it away. Good afternoon, uh, supervisors. Uh, my name is Arcel Vasquez Bluma, director of the Office of Cultural Competency, and a team, a team of us are here today to present the next June installment of the Cross System Coordinated Report on key efforts to support child safety and well being. I will let my co presenters introduce themselves. Good afternoon, Rocio Bendis with the Department of Family and Children's Services uh, Prevention Bureau Manager. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Sims. I'm the Deputy Chief of Juvenile Services. I'm just loading up the presentation. Oh. No problem.
in the interim, I'm just going to get started with the presentation um, so we can move it along. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, so thank you. As always, uh, the focus of the report is to present on key efforts that if fully supported and implemented will lead to improved child safety and well-being outcomes. To deliberately track process implementation efforts to ensure system accountability and commitment to key strategies. And thirdly, to evaluate how these strategies link to child and family outcomes. The report is composed of three main sections. Section one focuses on community prevention and early system diversion strategies. Many of these strategies were a direct result of participation in the Title IV-E Wellbeing Project. Section two focuses on the implementation and now maintenance and continued organizational support of the child and family practice model. And the third section is dedicated to other emerging topics or issues that departments want to share with CSFC and the public. The current structure of the, of the report has been in place for two and a half years, and we are finding that several of the key strategies that initiated this work have been fully implemented, found to be successful, and fully integrated into departmental work. It will be important for uh, next, it will be an important next step for the Well-Being Steering Committee to review and the scope and focus of the report aimed at implementation and assessment of strategies aimed at reducing racial disparities and to revamp the focus of the report. Another recommendation from our partners um, on the report is to report to the committee uh, on this work on an annual basis. This is the logic model that guides the present report and was more thor thoroughly reviewed in earlier reports to CSFC. This is also the logic model that will be reviewed by the Wellbeing Steering Committee. It is included in each report to let members of the public know how the vision, organization, and goals of the present report were formulated. I will quickly cover a couple of highlights uh, in the next slides. The full executive summary is included in the legislative file report. In section one, focus on community prevention and early system diversion, it should first be noted that the Department of Family and Children's Services, DFCS, will return to CSFC in August 2019 to provide a comprehensive reporting on departmental prevention strategies. As noted earlier, some strategies have proven successful and have been integrated within department's programming. One example of this is probation's court-appointed Friends and Advocates Mentoring Program, or CAFA which will be covered later in the report. The Joint Foster Youth Task Force's final recommendations outline principles that align with those of DS, DFCS in the newly formed Prevention Bureau within DFCS. In section two, focus on maintenance of the child and family practice model, another, there's another example of full implementation of target strategies in, is DFCS's CFPM, the Child and Family Practice Model, foundational training that is now well integrated as part of DFCS's efforts to ensure common language and approach. As it regards child and family team meetings, or CFTs, uh, compared to the first three months cohort of families entering to case services, an increase was observed in the number of families experiencing CFT meetings. The DFCS Joint Decision-Making Unit is reviewing the data and helping develop additional research questions to understand opportunities for ensuring that all families are supported via child and family team meetings. Internal IT staff are also supporting development of the next iteration of the report based on methodology provided by SSA's Program Support and Evaluation Team as well as the Joint Decision-Making Team. In section three, focus on emerging issues and north, noteworthy topics, a trauma-informed and healing-centered framework brings system-wide commitment from internal and external partners, focus on transforming the system of care for children and their families. Later, we will review efforts by SSA's Council on Cultural Excellence to expand access to social services out in the community where a gap analysis identified opportunities. I'd like to highlight two uh, probation department strategies uh, for the uh, prevention of early, early um, system diversion. The first one is the dismissal assessment worksheet. 
um, which was developed with the uh, race, equity, and justice systems, time information workshops. This was developed through a cross-systems approach um, with key uh, juvenile justice stakeholders, the probation staff, and with the assistance from the Youth Advisory Council. This process was designed to, uh, to address black and Latino youth experiencing longer median times on probation. This increased time also um, could lead to the increase of risk to re recidivate as, as, a result, as a result of the longer time on probation. This is also to look at what is the appropriate time for youth on probation as it, as it um, is compared with the, the, their first level and their crime. This also created a mechanism where probation officers are required to engage with the youth and family um, for dismissal planning, meaning that when they are part of the program, how do we step them down from probation and up them into community natural um, supports. Uh, this tool uh, has now been systematically um, established throughout the probation department. Um, we are also the first jurisdiction to actually have such a, a process and work, a process and tool in place. The second one I'd like to hi highlight is the court appointed friends and advocates. This started as a pilot program that was focused on addressing the high percent of African Americans who were failing DJ program. Basically, what we saw was that from sorry, the outcomes that we saw, excuse me, <clears throat> the outcomes that we saw from the pilot program was a decrease in DEJ failures, a decrease in substance abuse, a decrease in unexcused absences from school, and an increase in self-esteem. Based on the positive outcomes that we were seeing, um, this program was then implemented on a system-wide basis for all youth in probation. So just to highlight um, some of DFCS's prevention strategies and how they align to the Joint Foster Youth Task Force, I just wanted to mention a couple of examples. So under the recommendation about listening to foster youth families and foster families as they are the best resources, one of the things that we're doing is really investing in community engagement as we reported in last reports. Uh, one example is our Quality Parent Initiative where we involve parents that have been involved in the system as well as youth in the system. And then we continue to do our um, community forums where, where our director is out in community soliciting feedback and also trying to engage them in participating in solutions. Uh, a focus on prevention, one of the things that's super exciting and Arcel already mentioned is the formation of the new DFCS Prevention Bureau. That's new, I don't know any other um, DFCS that has that, but it's super exciting because we're focused on upstream prevention, true primary prevention. In August, I'll be coming back to actually give a full detailed report on all the primary prevention efforts that we're doing. Uh, with respect to focusing on self-sufficiency for our community members, We've been piloting a lot of different projects. Uh, one of them is the Resilient Family Programs. We have now launched it in both Gilroy and in San Jose, East San Jose. Um, it's been hugely successful at capacity, actually over capacity, and uh, folks are very interested in participating in that. We will be also launching Parent Cafes, which is brand new and was actually highlighted as a suggestion from one of our community forums. Um, it just went out to RFP. Uh, it's a competitive proposal and just closed, so we will be reviewing those applications and selecting um, agencies to then run that program. Uh, with respect to supporting uh, youth and families at greatest risk, we're trying to be very creative in how we meet families in community. Um, again, our primary prevention effort, which is where we are providing services to families outside of our system, uh, we've added two new differential response paths, which will be launched July 1st. One is the post-adoption uh, path, and the second is a primary prevention path. So families that need services in community do not have to be in our system to get services in community. Uh, we're um, exploring some partnerships with school districts and trying to work with those students that have the highest absenteeism. Another example is New Hope for Youth. It's a contract around gang prevention efforts. Again, this isn't for the kids already in gangs. This is for those that are gang posturing or maybe are siblings to um, others that are in gangs and we want to catch those youth early and try to provide them with services. Um, Evidence-based uh, efforts. Uh, 
um, one of the things that the Prevention Bureau has been very strong at doing is working very closely with the Office of Research and Evaluation and creating logic models for every single project that we're piloting. We want to make sure that we're effective at what, we do, what we're doing and not just investing money in things that aren't producing results. So we have a clearly defined plan of action with our um, logic models and then ORE is also helping us develop strategies to collect that data. And then lastly, the culturally responsive services. Uh, the best example for that is our cultural brokers program. I want to say it's three years in. I report on that uh, report after report. It's been hugely successful. And um, staff in the department would love to see that expanded throughout the department. But with limited resources, we've kept it um, at the level that it's at. Um, just wanted to highlight one of the community forums. Uh, we continue to do several throughout um, the county, but the last one we did is with the Somos Mayfair community in East San Jose. Um, we had an excellent turnout of uh, members and leaders in the community, and they offered us some very frank feedback about what we can do and not do. But what they've consistently said is that they appreciate having DFCS in the community, that they are now having a different perspective of who we are and what we do. Uh, they really requested that staff show greater compassion and empathy when we are working with them and understanding their trauma. Um, and so we definitely are providing that feedback to our um, staff development to make sure that we cover that as extensively as we can in our training. They really requested and liked the idea of having some topic-specific trainings in the community, spe um, specifically around a mandated reporter training, parenting skills, domestic violence, substance abuse. So we'll be working with social workers to see if they themselves can run some of those uh, topics, those classes, so that we, again, are engaging staff with community. Um, Again, DFCS presence is something that's uh, repeated over and over. We will be launching a prevention website. It was supposed to have already been launched, so hopefully um, by the end of this month it will be. We will be hosting anything that is a community resource will be posted there, and we'll promote that website as we are out in community. And I, uh, oh, the last thing is the prevention hotline. Uh, they uh, said, and in more than one forum was brought up the idea of, we just need someone to call and ask them, how do I navigate services? How do I, I don't even know where to begin. It's so overwhelming. And so they, again, always suggest uh, some type of warm line where we, they can access services and know how to begin. Um, there are warm lines already in the community that we can maybe um, collaborate with to expand their scope and their range. Uh, we would need to study that and have some funding to um, support that. Um, uh, yep. uh, this is the Office of Community Engagement Model. As presented in other reports, OCP has the Office of Cultural Competency has the vision of creating a centralized approach to community engagement and creating a centralized repository of community feedback. System-wide partners will come together in the coming weeks to review an approach, which is visualized here on this slide, that follows best practices for community feedback loops. We will now move to section, uh, to progress in section two of the report. So this slide should actually be titled, it, it is around the child and family practice model, but it's really about the family voice part of the model and really um, putting emphasis on that. I've reported, uh, uh, every single time I've come up around the parent guardian survey, each year we improve in terms of our participation rate, but it has yet to be at the level that we would like it to be. Um, our survey this year, we did try different strategies and we were able to increase it to 51 parents, um, which doesn't give us adequate uh, numbers to be able to show that our results are generalizable. Um, however, our results continue to be positive, demonstrating that social workers practice the values of the child and family practice model. This is the last year of the um, uh, Title IV-E waiver, um, and the reason why I mention that is because NCCD um, is the one that has been facilitating this, um, this survey, and so going forward, we will have control of how we administer it and what we ask and how we ask it. So we will have a committee that will look at the survey and, and decide if we keep uh, keep it as it is and how we want to administer it going forward. Just wanted to highlight a few things that did come up in the survey that I think are important. Uh, 
One is that um, overall 76% um, of the respondents said that caseworkers listen to what, uh, what they and their family members are saying, so that's really important. It's about, again, that empathy and listening. Uh, secondly, 60% of the respondents um, said that caseworkers consider their opinions before making decisions about their families. It's about joint decision making. And lastly, 64% uh, uh, say that the caseworker notices the things that they are doing well, so it's acknowledging their strengths. And actually, I should say, I'm highlighting the always and often, but I should say the sometimes also should be included in those numbers as well. But overall, they continue to be positive. And then there's also some constructive feedback for us to consider. Um, the report also includes analysis um, on the progress of the development and tracking of families entering into service and the experience of a CFT meeting or a child and family team meeting within 60 days of entering into service. Um, compared to the last reporting period, it's not shown here, but it's in the report, more families are experiencing a CFT meeting. The last reporting period of January, or in the first reporting period, I should say, of January through March of 2018, um, it was the first quarter where the practice to hold child and family team meetings for all families entering the services was rolled out by the department. The chart presented here notes that shows that, ur that the shows that urgency is placed on holding child and family team meetings when children are placed in out of home care compared to children receiving in home services. Overall, 46% of children entering the services uh, into foster services received a CFT when in out of home. Um, however, CFT experience varies by race and ethnicity with 54% 54, 54 of Latinx children receiving a CFT within the recommended 60 days from entering into foster care, compared to 33% for both Asian Pacific Islander and African ancestry children. More data, however, is needed to identify stability, the stability of these findings and trends, and as well as program refinement opportunities. Um, and the JDM, the Joint Decision Making Team, and um, internal IT staff um, and uh, evaluation are working together on this. Last spring, the board, of, the board adopted a board resolution that demonstrates organizational commitment to trauma-informed and healing-centered care. They approved the manager position to lead implementation of the trauma healing framework recommended by and developed through the cross-agency services team, or CAS. The board also tasked CAS as an advisory body of this work. I should note that CAS is a cross-system collaborative of leaders in county human and criminal justice systems, the Division of Equity and Social Justice, Santa Clara County Superior Court Judges, First Five Santa Clara, County Office of Education, and numerous community organizations. CAS and its partners support system-wide commitment to taking transformational steps in working with families, youth, and individuals, and with each other in a manner that is trauma-informed, supports healing that is rooted in the community and individual circles of support, and that is informed by continuous improvement processes anchored in racial equity. The slide presents the vision, mission, and values of trauma-informed and healing-centered framework, where the vision is that interconnectedness is at the heart of healing. The new manager, Patricia Marquez, is overseeing implementation of the trauma healing framework, and she started at the beginning of 2019. Patty is working with SSA, DFCS, and the Behavioral Health Services Department, as well as other partners such as the National Compadres Network, in updating and implementing the trauma healing work plan. The work plan is being reviewed also with DFCS uh, with the approved um, to align the work of the of the committee with of the the cast of the framework with the approved assembly bill 2083 uh, titled trauma informed system of care um, cast has approved an agreement and is working to implement an outreach plan to demonstrate commitment to this work system wide the following is a snippet um, from the draft trauma healing system agreement it is presently awaiting county council approval on the naming of the document. 
Uh, so it's, it's not, so the title there doesn't show the whole, the whole uh, heading um, as it's being reviewed. Uh, then Petty Marquez will coordinate process, a process to celebrate system-wide commitment and to formally launch uh, implementation through CAF. Last year, a review of front-end child welfare federal measures were reviewed to understand referrals and to end recurrence of maltreatment as a function of race ethnicity and how this compares to the overall average. You know, these rates may be compared um, against the backdrop of focus prevention and early intervention strategies. Um, using data from UC Berkeley from the for the referrals measure, data showed that in the most recent available period, more referrals were being made to the child welfare and abuse and neglect, and neglect center. However, this was not observed to translate into an increase in entries into the child welfare system. As it relates to differences in experience by race and ethnicity, African ancestry and Latino children have higher rates of referral per 1,000 children in Santa Clara County compared to the overall rate of 33 uh, referrals per 1,000 children in Santa Clara County. As noted, there were no observed increases in entries into the child welfare system or the, or the train line remained flat. As it relates to differences in experience by race and ethnicity, entries have declined compared to the first three years in the reported period. But it should be noted that the trend continues with African ancestry more likely to enter child welfare compared to the overall entry of 1.4 children per 1,000 children in Santa Clara County. Uh, recurrence of maltreatment within 12 months of the first substantiated allegation went up in the last reporting period. This was mainly a function of Latinx and white children. There is a federal, federal standard for this measure that states that no more than 9.1% 9 9 of children should experience recurrence of maltreatment within 12 months. Only HCI and Native American children met the standard in the most recent reporting period. It should be noted that recurrence of maltreatment markedly declined for African ancestry children um, and went down to, similar, to levels similar to earlier period, periods after three years of increase. Finally, we would also like to share on the efforts of, so of the Social Services Council on Cultural Excellence to meet internal cross-departmental opportunities that support racial and social equity for SSA customers. A survey was done with community centers such as Emergency Access Network and Senior Nutrition Centers and First Five Family Resource Centers. Um, and we identified some opportunities uh, to further extend social services to, for identified centers. The SSA's contract division is working with its community center vendors to expand access to social services and support um, the development of service hubs. This concludes our presentation and we are open to questions and comments. Thank you. Just, I'll just start with one. Let me just start with one kind of broad question. On, on the disproportionality issue, uh, statistically, you know, we've seen numbers like this, um, graphs and charts like this for, for as long as I've been here, and I don't know how long before that, you know, that uh, that's been going on or those, those general ratios have occurred. Uh, particularly with regard to African American and and uh, Latinx being overrepresented, w where are we at in terms of deciding how we're going to deal with that? If I could just get started on this conversation, um. and I'm not asking for you to launch another study session right now. I just, I just, I'm asking for. Maybe where where is that work going on? Is that a fair, a, a more concise way of asking the question or getting an answer? So some of that work is um, through the prevention efforts that are happening within DSDS and the probation department and in other areas, such as universal access pilot is another of those strategies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, CAST is another area where we are certainly aware and we're bringing in the trauma-informed and human-centered lens. Uh, how, how do we expect that to ultimately make us a county where we don't have 
disproportionality in, in, you know, in the ultimate numbers. I think it, I, I will just start that we really need to continue to move upstream. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and understand, you know, how together as systems we can come together to support families in, in an in integrated fashion. Um, so those are some of the strategies. And, and you know, being trauma-informed and healing-centered is saying two things. One is that historically our families, our children, have experienced historical trauma. And it gets perpetuated, right? So we need to, con we need to cut into it. The other thing that that framework says is that healing is found in our communities, not in systems, but in the community. And that that happens through our interconnections, interconnectedness with each other through our families, right, and neighborhoods and, and neighbors um, and supports, but also that interconnectedness that has to happen at the systems level. And so a lot of this work um, that is happening through the well-being steering committee, mm -hmm. through CAST, um, you know, in, in you know, children of incarcerated parents is, is bringing all the different systems that are connected to children and families. Would you like yeah. to add Yeah, that was very well said. And um, I just, I, it has to be a multi-systems approach. It's not DFCS's responsibility, probation's responsibility, OCC's responsibility. There's no way any one agency or department can tackle that. Mm -hmm. uh, it predates this. These kids come already with historical trauma and or disproportionate situations that puts them in that place. So I think, uh, yes, I think the, pre the primary prevention work is super important, but to do that not only with our agency partners like the, school the schools, the districts, um, community agencies and all that, but also with community. So one of the things that I love about what Francesca has been doing in our community forums is she puts a call to action and says, this is an our responsibility, this is our responsibility, and how do we all step up and address this issue? Um, so I, th I don't think there's an easy answer to your question, it, it, but I think that some of the things that we're trying on, I think we'll see how they play out, and that's why we're putting a lot of effort in the evaluation of it. But we can't keep doing the same thing over and over. Can and I just so, yeah? Can I just also add? I think also Gare provides that opportunity. What, what uh, does? Gare, the government, the government alliance on race and equity, in the sense that what Gare is saying um, to system to jurisdictions is you have to look at all aspects of an organization. You know, um, so we are working together as different partners, system partners. But even within each system, within each um, agency. We have to look at how we do recruitment, right? Is is how we're doing recruitment, bringing in community that is ref, that is um, that represents the community that we're serving. For example, how are we doing hiring? How are we doing our budgeting, our contracting through our procurement? So it's it's not only the systems coming together, but it's also the work that happens within government. You know, the, the different areas of government work. Yep, and and there is a um, there is also implicit bias that's involved in in the systems. Um, and as we look through, look at our own processes and continue to look at them, we find these little nuggets where we think we're doing the right thing, but it ends up having an unintentional uh, consequence. One of the examples was the, the dismissal from probation. Um, we want to help these kids so we keep them longer in our, in our system, which inevitably some of those kids turn out to be a bad thing because now they're cut off from pro-social activities and more attached to antisocial peers. So some of those things um, that are, un are unintentional, we have to be more careful and looking at them and, and sorting those out, weeding those out, rooting those out, so that as a system, we don't end up pulling these kids into our system in the name of, of doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know it's not easy because in the 27 years I've been in elective office, nobody's been able to remedy it at all. Um, in, in any of the systems that you're referencing that I've seen or been involved with. But I also don't, I don't see, I see a lot of s study and sort of re reaffirmation of the numbers and the statistics. And, and very few times in my career as an elected official or I work in public services, have I seen actual con convenings and confrontation between the people who represent the systems who are, who are involved with 
the implicit bias in the first place. So um, I, I'm afraid that without that confrontation, and I do mean confrontation, um, that we're gonna be running in place for another 27 years. And of course, as we all, as we all know, the concern with that is that a child who is born today, um, who is going to, to be um, one of the kids in the Franklin McKinley School District or the Elmrock School District where we're trying to put systems in place for diversion is, is essentially right now predestined to be um, overrepresented is a nice way to put it, but to be in a system that um, is not, has absolutely no corollary to, to success and, you know, a holistic um, and, and otherwise um, appropriate life. So, again, I, there, were, there was a time just since I've been on this board where this kind of a, a meeting would have been pretty, um, pretty different. There, there would have been people here exhibiting some hostility. There would have been more people on the panel like we had with the last discussion. Um, there would have been a lot of blame, but uh, finger pointing, unfortunately, that's what happens when people start getting defensive about whether there's, their part of the system is, is being accused of, of contributing to this problem. Um, but I do think this is one of those really kind of major, major issues, especially here in Santa Clara County, um, that, that we're not gonna be able to, to remedy without that kind of confrontation happening. So I don't know how to encourage that um, other than to say that as we convene people around the table, I do think it needs to be less about the statistics that we all know are out there. You don't have to be, you could, you could look at our, you know, on, on any of the systems, not just the child welfare, but you could look at any dashboard at any moment and they're generated all the time. They hit our desks all the time, juvenile probation, whatever. Uh, if you want to get the ones from the education community, they'll send them over here, right? Graduation rate, dropout rate, expulsion rate, suspension rate. Anyway, you can see it in the foster system. So we know the st statistics, um, but I'm just feeling the last few years there's an aversion to um, the kind of confrontational, difficult conversations, a, a good friend of mine used to call them, that, that need to happen across the table and day in and day out and day in and day out until, until we figure out how to, how to shift the systems and put checks in the systems that, that, that start to essentially block the pathway that the implicit bias is, is, is tracking some of these kids down. Um, so anyway, I, so you know, I'm, I I'm nearing I'm nearing my you know much my last 18 months here, but it, <laughs> this is a, a very it's going to sound like a very strange analogy probably to all of you, but I do think at some point it becomes a problem in terms of us being challenged uh, from a civil rights standpoint, you know, judicially, or the analogy is. You know, where we finally arrived, it seems, with 240 bills in the legislature on housing, half of which are trying to take local control away by saying, you can't do this, or you aren't gonna be rewarded anymore for that kind of behavior. I, I feel like that's, you know, where we're headed at, at some point, where somebody's gonna say, and succeed, um, especially if we continue to have a very progressive legislature, um, we don't really care whose fault it is, but if you have numbers that are this disproportionate, we're gonna start tying the funding that you receive or not, you know, to to that. And that, that would probably be fairly tragic in the sense that you can't force these numbers. It's not, and you shouldn't be forcing these numbers, right? We need to have, we need to have healthy, holistic change in the system and of course get to the root cause, implicit or overt bias taken out of the system, but I, I fear that at some point there's gonna be wholesale kind of activity, um, forced activity. We saw it recently with our jails, you know, we had to react to um, 
we had to re we had to react to basically being targeted as a, a big wealthy county that um, was a good example for you know a um, public interest law firm to come to come at us and say you, you can't have these conditions in, in your jail that that, viol that seem to violate a whole bunch of civil rights laws and other laws in the country so we're just going to come in and start heading for a consent decree so I, I know that's probably not going to make anybody work different or harder because that just sounds like some kind of a threat but I, I sooner or later <laughs> this has to this has to come to a head and and, and not and this isn't just an, a, a situation that every county is, is in you know across the country yes I think there's been disproportionality with regard to the African-American community that's pretty um, obviously obviously um, unfortunate but it's it's occurred throughout systems across the country and counties from here to you know Prince George's County and the, the other the other coast but with the Latino community it's not something that we see up and even up and down the state that in, in terms of consistency with the numbers we our county jumps out I think as a pretty serious target for for somebody coming after us, um, whether it's legislative or whether it's you know with, from a legal standpoint, and of course, we're a county that innovates and leads, and you know you would sit up here and want us to be out in front of that and, and prevent that from happening in the first place. So it's not much of a pep talk, um, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hoping at some point we can just get back to having having the fight. Let's, let's just have the fight and fight it out and, and see if we can get you know some more significant change in the system with, with all these other partners that are out there it's it's not your fault <laughs> it's not anyone's fault it's it's about you know having the fight I think so um, I want to just make a recommendation about about this um, ironically uh, Dana I'll get to you in just a minute ironically Dave one of the the challenges that I've been having as a chair is that for a lot of the cross systems work and this one in particular I think the staff is really wanting us to give them a chance I say it's ironic because the amount of time it takes them to come and report I recognize is a it's seen on your end as a burden on our end it's seen as responsible oversight right um, that all being said what I one of the things that um, maybe we just do this today as a motion from this item and then we can bring a written referral and I'll just mention this I don't know where oh Ames. Um, we had I had been having an on um, a long conversation with dr. Smith about um, how we address equity in a meaningful way everything from how we're addressing budgeting to these kinds of topics and part of the point I think that um, that Dr. Uh, Blume raised about GARE that's so interesting is that it is an external, I think in a really good way, an external way of saying government, stop, take a breath, and figure out what you're doing right and well. And by the way, let's look at all the policies that you have that were designed with, with a significant amount of implicit bias in them. And I think that's actually the point you were raising about, you know, earlier about how do we keep folks out of our systems because our systems contribute to it's hard to it's hard to imagine I mean it's hard to say that our systems contribute to success for these particularly for foster youth we you know we don't have a or for foster families so I what I would like to recommend is that as part of the so what what dr. Smith is recommending that we think about and I think you and I can move this forward from here and then we can put language around it if you're comfortable with it is that he suggested that rather than just doing sort of a deep dive as a panel that we do a conference around equity in the fall mm -hmm. and that we could take an initial crack at it by having using one of our children's family seniors committee to walk through all the areas that we wanted to take a deeper dive in to really um, hone in on where we should be looking at equity issues do a conference where we let everybody break out where there's a specialty right a high interest in foster care or a high interest in education funding and a number of those things come back together with a series of recommendations not just for our own, our own institution 
but for all the institutions that we invite to participate. And in some ways, this would be much more like a, I, I think, I'm, I'm not sure I've completely understood all the value of the hackathons because I feel like it's a lot of people getting together telling us, like doing a deeper analysis on problems that we already recognize we have, but not so much on the solutions. The idea here would be to challenge um, the departments and the community to come forward with concrete recommendations about how we move the dial. And so that, that I, I, and then that we would be able to bring those back in whole or in pieces to the board for a deeper dive. And I think to your point, it really does force that courageous conversation because essentially what we'd be saying is, come and tell us what we're doing right and wrong in this area. So people presenting who are experts in education, people who are presenting who are experts, and by experts I, I mean community expertise as well. Um, and I, I think while this has a lot of different layers to it, I think we can discreetly pull out some areas like foster care and, um, and, and dive in on what we're doing right and wrong. And I think that's actually something we should be doing. So, what I will recommend is that, um, Amy, out of this meeting, that the way we respond to what um, Supervisor Fortesi is raising is that we will bring a referral to the board to do a conference around equity. I'd like to do it in the fall. I feel like you do. You know, I, I recognize that, well, anyway, that we would do a conference in the fall with the idea that we would be able to start bringing recommendations to whatever committee and the full board right after that because, um, I feel like we don't always have the answers, we being the board, of course, but the challenge we have is that when we do find things we wanna do, um, and I know you all find this too, it just takes forever to do it, and we really are talking about um, the lives of children and families in time that we can never give them back if we don't do it right. And I do wanna just say, Dave, as I was listening to you, I had this re recollection of being at the city and having a conversation about um, park space because the areas that, that as you know, I represent now and represented then had a whole, we have a lot of cars and not so much parks, right? A lot of people living in houses and not parks. And I remember us getting funding to build a number of parks and being told that, that we would get these parks done, that'll be done in year 50 or year whatever. And I had this recollection of watching a family with a, a woman who's pregnant with a little one playing um, in one of our smaller parks. And I just had someone come and give a presentation about how um, children get strength in their hands so that they can write and that sometimes things we think of like the monkey bars and other things that kids are doing, that those were really good for development and you know other things and, and why tummy time and learning how to flip over, all that stuff is really good for strength building. And I was thinking, you know, we're gonna miss, both of these children will be in high school before we plant a blade of grass, high school. And then they'll be in college when they're done. And maybe we're gonna be around for their kids. And so one of the challenges I think that I'm feeling too with foster care in particular is that we did this really long process and it should have been long, we got a lot of feedback and um, and getting it over the finish line, getting any single task over the finish line is feels really, just really challenging. And I know it is for you too. So I know we're all part of a system that doesn't move. The real question is how do we, how do we light um, some fire under the, ourselves? And, I, and by the way, I, I just wanna say too, and I think Dave is saying this, this is not a finger pointing exercise because there's, there's a lot of people of goodwill trapped in a system that doesn't let us excel on behalf of other people and that's what we have to fix, right? But part of how do we do it is I think the bigger question, how do we do it fast? So if you're okay with that, and Amy, do you understand that long? Amy's like, stop, you're off your schedule by like a week. Um, so we'll move forward with that. I do wanna say thank you. And I also, um, I just wanna say, this was a very, very well done report. Like there really was a lot to learn. And I think that's partly what's got us like these juices going. And I would just say to all of your departments, um, if you all wanna give us feedback on that, like how we dive into equity, and, and I'm really excited about GAIR. Like I, I think that is an opportunity for us that we actually have to expand and really get some leadership that can just do that full time because the county's too big to have a couple part-time people working on GAIR. Um, 
so we'll come back and talk about that. But I would be very interested in getting all of your feedback on how we should design that conference. Who's got to be there? How do we get the public engaged in it? Because in some ways, I think the point Dave is raising is right. We've got to get some people to yell at us, which reminds me to invite up Dana, who never yells but has a perspective. <laughs> Thanks, Dana, for your patience. Dana Bennett, Kids and Commons. Supervisor Cortez, I just wanted to respond a little bit to um, your comments too. Um, John Powell, who's a civil rights expert up at Haas, um, in Berkeley, Haas Center in Berkeley, talks about targeted universalism. And part of that is continuing to disaggregate the data and think about your different subpopulations and what targeted efforts will make. You know, it's having a universal goal, but then targeting how you work with those different subpopulations to meet their needs. Part of the success of the DEJ program for African American youth was that um, experts were brought in, like Yvonne Maxwell was brought in to say, what do we need to do different in this program? How do we want to prepare these mentors? First of all, they should be mentors of the same race as these youth. And how do we prepare them to think about the family dynamics? So if we expand CAFA to like Latinx kids, we need to do the same process with, um, you know, thinking about what are the cultural needs, what are the, what are we going to do different in order to make sure it's successful with these young people. Um, we just heard data this morning at a meeting about from the school readiness assessment, and there are like eight factors that really kind of improve school readiness. So Latinx kids, Latinx boys in particular, are really low in terms of school readiness. But then when you go and look at those eight factors, and when the Latinx boys have those eight factors, they're up there with everybody else. So it's, it's looking at the data in that way and trying to figure out what levers to pull for different groups. And I, so I just encourage us to continue to disaggregate data and bring that lens of equity to it to say, you know, um, Jeff Andretti Duncan talks about equity is about giving people what they need when they need it. And, and so rather than doing, you know, typically we do these blanket approaches but we really need to be thinking about how do we not make a cookie cutter and how do we make it focus on the outcome we're trying to get. So, so I think we're starting to do that more in the county, but we need to kind of be relentless about doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else, Dave, you're okay? Yeah, I, I appreciate your, you know, your recommendation coming out of this in the fall summit, and I think I can, I've waited this long, I think I can hold <laughs> any further comments you know, until then. I do, I only want to say as sort of a disclaimer when I was comparing African American and Latino numbers, you know, sort of broadly county by county, I'm not suggesting by any means that anything other than all categories of demographics should, should come down or should be, should not be disproportionate. They should, whatever issues we have in my mind should be neutral or proportionate as to as to demographics, especially ethnic and racial demographics. So I wasn't trying to say one is acceptable, one is not based on national standards or local standards. To me, none of it is accept acceptable. And I, I, I'm sure I'm stating something that everyone else agrees to. I just want to clarify my own co earlier comments, that's all. Um, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. We'll look forward to further discussion. And please give us feedback on that summit. Thank you. So Jeff, you've been very patient. My other favorite subject, the hub. Yay, tell me when it's open. <laughs> Let's start with the end. <laughs> what? Welcome. Thank you, Jeff Draper from the Facilities and Fleet Department. I'd like to introduce one of our amazing planners, Emily Chen, she'll provide the report here today. Hi everyone. Um, we have a short presentation ready to share with you today that provides a really brief overview of the recommended plan at the new hub. Could you do um, that please? Because you only haven't seen it yet. Have you seen it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, in the interest of your time, would you like us to proceed with the presentation? Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll do the presentation. Yes. Yeah, yeah I got it. Four slides. Three more four All slides. Right. Uh, so we recently completed the planning process for the new hub program, which included identifying services that we want to include at the hub, 
And then also determining what type of space types, how many of these spaces that we should include in the facility to support the delivery of these services. Um, I'll start with providing some context on the property. So the new hub location is at the corner of Parkmore Avenue and Meridian Avenue in San Jose. The parcel is about 1.6 acres and it includes four existing separate buildings. Um, B and D at the very end being the two larger buildings and C and A in the middle are relatively the same size. So based on the service that we've heard identified by our program managers, our stakeholders, um, our partner organizations, and input from our hub youth, we were able to um, group these service types into four main categories, which then translated into the four separate buildings that are already there. These include the social enrichment building, support, health and wellness, and employment and education. Um, the one, oh, yeah, go back in. <laughs> one thing that you might notice that we wanted to mention was that um, one difference from the current hub program is that if you look at this new recommended program is that we have substantially increased the number of meeting rooms, which now accommodates you know multiple classes and workshops at the same time, and also a lot of smaller and medium-sized meeting rooms that can be used for group meetings and then also one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, that are more intimate and need a little bit more privacy, which, um, which we currently don't have. And uh, another thing that I wanted to mention was that the recommended plan also includes our sustainability efforts and public art. Oh, here we go. So with that, um, this recommended plan, we anticipate to begin design this August with construction beginning in early 2020, 2021 and occupancy of the program in mid-2023. Mm -hmm. With that, thank you for listening and um, please let us know your comments and questions. So, um, so I'll just start by saying that I want to, I want the kids to be in it sooner. So I want to have a conversation about how to do that. And then the other thing is, if you can go back to the slide that just shows the programmed areas, back one more okay so um, Dave I just wanted to highlight a couple things that I, that I thought might be of interest to you so one is that the kids really the young people gave feedback to the program areas the two um, issues that I raised with the staff I actually raised uh, three of them one was I was concerned about how much private staff area there was um, private like the support areas are talking about are really I think they're more like break areas for the staff and places for them to go do their work. What I wanted to make sure of is just that the square footage of these support areas, which I know are necessary, are in fact um, recognizing that we're going to have staff, some that are permanently placed there and a lot that aren't, so that we're using a shared desk model so that we don't have areas that are off limits to the young people and you know because it really is intended to be a, a very active building for them um, so I still I still have a little bit of a concern about that and I'll just put that out there um, the second issue is that I would very much like to understand the costs of that hatched areas um, so because it in some ways it doesn't make sense for us to have potential areas and I'm assuming they're potential because we don't yet we don't have all of our costs in is that accurate? So for the potential half court area, well, we wanted to keep it flexible, you know, as we dive deeper into design. Um, but for the half court area, it is potential because we're keeping it flexible, you know, when we do need more parking space or we want to change that space into a patio or there's a barbecue, we can remove that basketball court, you know, to the side. And if I could clarify, you ask if the, all the costs are included for this. The answer is yes. We, the, the rough order magnitude estimate that's been done so far includes, includes these all. build outs yes. mm -hmm. instead of, again, so then I'm not understanding exactly what you just said about, so let's use another area like the children's outdoor play area. We're building a children's outdoor play area. But it, it's, it's an area where they could, uh, we, we had looked into um, putting together some, uh, or uh, like taut furniture 
or cut, slice, things uh, things that are not permanently built, but where we are trying to keep those flexible. Because you want the areas area. to be flexible. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, just, you know, if, if there are different changes or if they want to bring in new equipment. Um, and we're, we're for it at this at this time, we're not in design yet, so we were just okay. making recommendations. So here's what I would like to make make um, sure of. One is that um, from the young people who gave us feedback, the program areas, the children's area, I don't remember so much about the garden, but the children's area in particular has come up as a important um, piece of it. I can't remember about the garden, and I know that the basketball court did too. So. What I just want to recommend is that um, if, if as we move forward with programming that, that these aren't going to be permanent, that those be highlighted for us, that's number one. And number two, I'd be interested in the discrete cost of the, um, the half court, the garden, and the children's area because there, that may be an opportunity for us to raise money for very specific you know, something very discreet that I may be able to go to a foundation for. So as we pull all these together, pull, pull those pieces out, all right? Um, so, and then the, the only, so there was that. And then the, the other thing I wanted to just, um, I, w I wanna thank you, because I think this is really reflective of what the students wanted. I really appreciate you putting in the snack area, and because I want a refrigerator that kids can get into whenever they want. You know, I, I have one of those kids who does that, and the idea that, you know, we've heard from the kids that, they, that one of the things they don't get to do is they don't have a refrigerator. They can just feel free to jump in and get stuff out, and I, this has gotta be that, right? Um, so all that being said, as we, when we get through the design phase, at least the initial design, I would like us to get a rough estimate, again, around cost. And um, and for a couple reasons, I do think we could get some help with foundations. And so if it allows us the flexibility to put more money into something else that we're gonna build, it, it would be helpful, including the cost of the refrigerator, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's something that I might be able to go to somebody and say, pay for that. Mm -hmm. You know, and so as much as you can help me think about those areas that we can reach out to partners so that it allows us to invest more in the other areas, particularly with furniture and, you know, that kind of stuff that, that is going to be important in terms of it being a place young people really want to be. We'll certainly loop back with you as the, as the design develops and the estimates refine. But not 23. The challenge is obviously this coming year is really about the design and the permitting phases, right? And so we can talk more about what we can do to accelerate the construction phase. Got it. And is the permitting phase, do we need to get permits from who? Ourselves, from our planning and development department. Oh, let's work with them. <laughs> no, I'm completely serious. <laughs> let's do a meeting with them and just understand how to. We might gain a little time there. <laughs> okay. Unless they want to see me every day. All right. Nobody wants that. Okay. Um, I think those were my big things. Did you have anything, Dave? Just th listening to what you're looking for here, if I'm hearing it correctly, I'm just wondering if sort of at some point concurrent with the continued development of the critical path that there's actually, um, it's a little more on the economic development side, a, a sponsorship package that's pre-inserted mm -hmm. into this so that it's not after the fact coming forward sounds like you were kind of moving in that direction okay. but you said it better thank you the, I mean, we have a standing policy at the county as to how you can name rooms and how you can do that but it's all after the fact and it's very restricted in some mm -hmm. sense to preference toward names of people who aren't alive anymore that type of thing and I, I just think maybe we I think with one of our uh, properties parks properties um, we've gone down that path a little bit the sports complex of having some things built into um, the plan that's out there, the documents that are out there that, that allow um, sponsorship revenue kind of sharing arrangements mm -hmm. and what you'd want, what you don't want. Because that's gonna take some thought too, especially in a facility like this. I mean, who, who would be eligible mm -hmm. from a um, social responsibility standpoint, you know, mm -hmm. to, to maybe come in and, and have some opportunity, commercial opportunity, to, to sponsor a flexible half court, for example. I mean, so I, mm -hmm. I'm just I encouraging think that's an if that's, if that's I, I'm for that, if I have no problem with it, 
but if that's what we're really talking about, especially on some of those outdoor areas, to um, start sooner rather than later to set up a unique um, path program, yeah, yeah. yeah that's going to be in place that the board of supervisors would ultimately approve. That says, yeah, in these in this project in these areas, these are the kinds of this is the criteria for bringing in sponsorship money and, and how it would be displayed, you know, how the sponsorship would, would sort of get its its branding um, from that. Understood. And um, two things that I would recommend, let's talk to, to the VMC Foundation, to Chris Wilder, to get some ideas from him about that. And I think the point that, Dave, that you're raising is so wise is that if we have if we have a structure in place, even if we have to bring it at the very first meeting in, in, of the board in, in um, August, I mean, high, high level, I'm not talking about, I just want to give you all, I don't want anybody to be mad that you went and did something later, right. but um, <laughs> Jeff's like, that's good. <laughs> but if we could, if, um, if we have that opportunity to bring something in, get some of Chris's feedback, the thing that would help as it relates to the design is that we may want to have a brick pathway, you know, so that people's names can be in bricks if I'm they sure. give a certain amount. Um, I think that's really what Dave's talking about that I think is just a really great opportunity. Something, um, a, a designer could help us think about that. And that way we have something literally that if it's not a room and it's a brick, you know, that they're helping kids and, you know, or the refrigerator or, you know, just some discrete pieces like that I think would be great. Agreed. All right, good. Thank you. Any, anybody else on that one? All right. Thanks very much. All right. So last we're going to go to our reports. You got anything you want to report? Either one of you. McCoy. All right. I just wanted to provide an update on uh, uh, the RFA report that I, uh, the, the off agenda report. Uh, the, j just wanted to kind of summarize our three-pronged approach with our focus on family finding, uh, on recruitment, and then the post-recruitment support. So most recently, we had uh, a training from some from from LA County because they've really done a lot more and they, their numbers look a lot better with regard to family finding. So that's something uh, that we did, and we're hoping to learn what what they've been doing. We've also embedded a uh, family finding component into our contracts so that all of our vendors actually have that built into the work that they do. Seneca is actively doing that and we're expecting a report from them fa fairly soon. We also have Aaliyah providing additional training, especially around, uh, you know, it's called uh, Trauma Care Competency Professional Development Program to really uh, shore up the social workers' skills when it comes to understanding trauma and all of the the, the, the high needs that our that our kids have, uh, that that our, our our youth have. So that's something that we're trying to build also for uh, resource families. Uh, and then our recruitment efforts are uh, so you know that that is harder trying to get those. Uh, uh, resource uh, families recruited, uh, and we have a couple uh, programs like the Therapeutic Foster Care and the, the uh, ISFC that's really working on trying to build capacity for, for our resource families. So that's that's what we've been doing with with, with regard to that. And I, I believe that off-agenda report went to you. And I yeah, just and I would just say one thing about the resource families. I still want to get make sure that gets agendized because the problem is we can recruit to the cows come home. Yeah, we can't. We don't have a financial package that marries the need of what we're asking people to do. They can't. You know, we're, we need the people who can be home. Somebody can be home full time, and we're not paying them to do that. And right. it's just not going to happen unless we figure out a way to invest more resources. Right. I, I mentioned that because we, we've had this kind of tepid conversation at a couple different points, and mm -hmm. at some point we just we. And if we're not going to do it, that's okay too. But we we should be able to say. This is what it actually costs to provide the mm -hmm. services for the mm -hmm. high-need kids we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if we're not taking that path, here are all the things we're going to do instead of that. Mm -hmm. I think in the end we're going to end up funding those programs better because otherwise we're training people who are moving to other places to do this work. And 
Mm -hmm. That just yeah. kind of seems the story of Silicon Valley right now. But, right. but thank you for those other updates. Yeah. And then uh, lastly, I just wanted to say we have embarked on a lot of engagement efforts in SSA, engagement and employee well-being efforts. Great. So we have a unit that's focused on employment engagement and well-being and really looking to have more culture and climate surveys in SSA so that we can understand the needs of our staff too. So that's great. Very yeah. good. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Um, just wanted to give one update. As part of the governor's adoption of the new state budget, there was trailer bill language that was also included um, as part of that. And the language um, is specific to child support. Um, what it does is it creates uh, another round of discussions between the California Department of Child Support Services and the California Child Support Directors Association. Um, among the things that are uh, required to be discussed uh, in these sessions that will begin as early as July 1st uh, to further refine and codify the local agency funding methodology, uh, discuss additional strategies that might improve customer service, uh, pragmatic collectability, and the cost efficiency of the child support program, consider any policy changes that may affect the workload and associated funding needs of local county child support agencies, and consider the ways that child support collection improves outcomes for children. Um, the Child Support Directors Association is developing a work group to work with the state on this process, along with numerous other stakeholders, which would include uh, the Legislative Analyst Office, uh, State Department of Finance, uh, legislative staffers, and parent advocacy groups. As a uh, member of the board of directors for the Child Support Directors Association, I look forward to be part of those meetings and report out on how those discussions progress after July 1st. Thank you. Okay, thank you both for the reports. Um, I think we are at adjournment and um, we're likely not gonna be back until August. I'm not sure exactly what the date is, but it'll be properly noticed and publicly, publicly and properly noticed. August 21st, is that it? Okay.